Hello! Welcome to the third episode of Five of the Week. We are a weekly recap show discussing anything that's happening in NCAA basketball on the SBA. To remind all listeners, it's not a D Five of the Week, it's a Select Five of the Week. Uh, this week we have a different lineup. Danger Golding had personal business to take care of and we could not come to a typical recording schedule, so I'm here with uh, Cryptic Pancake, my player name is Finn Singman. Thank you very much for stepping in for Danger Golding as well. Uh, I would like to, before we go, remind our listeners about the All-Star Week double claim on all weekly point tasks and the special All-Star Week point task where you can give feedback about the community and its state. Uh, you can find it in, I believe, NCAA announcements section of the forum. You can find the SBA announcements too. And so basically it's uh, what they do every year for the, or every season, I should say, for the all-star festivities. Um, so during this week you get, so every PT that you would do is doubled. So every time where you do a media spot, a graphic or a podcast, rather than being worth six points, they're worth 12. And furthermore, if you do the all-star weekend point task, which uh, there's a format you have to follow. You get an extra four uncapped points. Yes, uh, I'm new to this All-Star Week part as I joined mid last season after the All-Star <clears> Week. <throat> so thank you very much for letting me know as well. Uh, <clears throat> but we'll move on to our five of the week now. Our first of the week is from game day six. Arizona played at Syracuse and uh, Syracuse after overtime beat Arizona 120 to 117 but uh, the game had a exhausting and high scoring overtime period and we would like to discuss uh, that here uh, the game was 101 after regulation and uh, so uh, in this game the player of the game was championship defense and he had 22 points uh, he had 9 rebounds and 4 steals then, of course, there was uh, Caramelo Anthony, who had 37 points to go with 12 rebounds. And then uh, there was two more 30-point scores, one of them being Junior Jackson for Arizona. He had uh, 34 points, and then there was still Caramelo's uh, teammate and partner wing, or wing partner, J.K. Kirby, who scored 32 points. The overtime period started even, obviously. The team stayed neck and neck for the first five possessions, but then an uh, awful bit of offensive run by Arizona saw them with two consecutive zero-point trips up the floor. Uh, the lead rose to five, and Syracuse absolutely broke that neck with five to nothing and six to nothing runs separated by only a single three-point make by Arizona. At one point, Syracuse led 117 to 109, but Arizona managed to put in effort all the way to the end, uh, losing 120 to 117 at the final whistle. Xavier Venon had two points, four assists, one steal and one block, and uh, he was the hero of the overtime to me. He had uh, one assist down the court on the offense, then a block, and then a assist to a three-point make, all in succession. And Anthony Carmelo as well had seven points and two assists only in the overtime period. So uh, championship defense gave the Orange an eight-point lead with two minutes and 23 seconds to go in the overtime. And he was also named player of the game due to his play during the entire game. And Junior Jackson on the side of Arizona, he seemed to run out of gas, seeing as in the overtime period, he only hit two corner threes, which for the whole overtime period, six points, you would want more out of your main scoring option. Yeah, definitely a tightly contested matchup, but uh, Syracuse proving their worth in the overtime period. Uh, it's always fun to focus on single games. 
here on our program and a big thank you for the simmer of the game day Jogen for providing me with the play-by-play -play for the overtime so that uh, leads us to the second of the week we're finished with our first uh, our topic this time is Anthony Caramello reaching top 40 actually sitting in 36th in NCAA career points last week he has he had 5478 so far and i believe his career average is around 23 so caramello is now in his senior year as of right now his season averages last year was 25.8 points and to go with 6.5 rebounds and a true shooting percentage of 54.5 um, but yeah, so for as of right now in this season, Caramello is averaging 29.7 points and he has 6.4 rebounds. So his rebounding pretty much stayed the same, but his points have once again gone up by four. So he's really looking like uh, one of the best scorers this year. And he's also very consistent. He really has some games where he just puts his whole team on his back and carries them to victory. Anthony Caramello currently standing in third place in points per game as well, I believe. Uh, we have a small quote. Uh, the Syracuse Orange athletic director was kind enough to provide us with, with a respectful story towards his uh, stalwart guard. So... <clears throat> This is all by Hockey is 66, the Syracuse Orange athletic director. Anthony Caramello joined the Qs in our second year in the NCAA and has started every game he has played for us since in a orange uniform. He was the perfect recruit for us. He played over 35 minutes and averaged 15 points that first season. His minutes played have gone up each season and so has his points per game as he is nearly at 30 points per game this season he was a major factor his sophomore season and one of the main reasons beside Cole and Zhang that the Qs went to the national championship game not only will he be top 20 in both scoring and three pointers made he has an outside chance of being in a top 10 in both he has always been a team player first and his example has helped us in the recruiting process this season, he is one of the major reasons the Orange will push not only for a tournament bid, but also sniff around for the division title. It's going to be an awesome ride these final 46 games of his career. So thank you very much, Hockey66. Uh, we'll also be anticipating an awesome ride these final 46 games of his career. And hopefully Syracuse will make the tournament. So you can extend that for the six games so that's our second of the week we'll move on to our third of the week uh, we'll, we'll, where we'll be focusing on the Kansas Jayhawks the Kansas Jayhawks finished their second week with a even 500 record being 16 to 16 their last 10 games record has been encouraging five wins and five losses with a win at Oregon and claiming victories in both high scoring and low scoring contests. Their big man Halter Wehrmann boasted the highest rebounds per game in the league of 8.9 while playing only around 31 minutes per game. Wehrmann has improved his scoring efficiency this year and has been playing off uh, <coughs> off has been playing awesome defense. Wehrmann is also top 10 in blocks per game ahead of rim-protecting stalwarts such as Jake Bamba from Duke Blue Devils and uh, championship defense from the Syracuse Orange. The Jayhawks are also in the top half of the nation in team steals and their on-court identity is slowly starting to get established. Uh, what do you think about the Kansas Jayhawks? Do you think they might be underrated or is this just a flash in a pan run uh, no i think that they are a bit underrated because they have a very balanced team 
Um, so if you look at their team TPE totals, uh, it's looking pretty good. They have out of what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out of eight players, only two of them have less than 100 TPE. I think for the main reason why they were a bit overlooked coming into this season is due to the fact that they only have one player that's uncapped, that player being Patrick Filter. And yeah, but their three standout players this season until right now have been Patrick Filter, Brandon Wilson, and uh, Haita Vermann, who really have been stepping it up for them. As you already said, Vermann, he's in the top 10 in blocks. Along that, he's also leading the league in rebounds. So he'll make sure that the team, if you get a stop, that it'll stay a stop, and the team that's currently on offense doesn't get a second chance to score again. Furthermore, Patrick is in the top 10 in three-point percentage, which that's always a very good thing to have. And lastly, Wolf is in the top 20 in scoring, and his TP total is at 150 right now. It's only going to go up, and I feel like they're going to be a good team next season. Definitely not only looking for the immediate future, but also next season and possibly the season past that as well. Uh, the Kansas Jayhawks are, in my opinion as well, somewhat underrated. And uh, and looking through the player list, there's not one player that stands out as a massive superstar for the college level as you can look through teams such as the Michigan State Spartans, uh, where you have arguably three great, great, awesome players, and they're still not actually doing well, living up to their expectations. So for the Kansas Jayhawks, staying around uh, around a 500 record in a tough, tough Big Ten division would be a fantastic accomplishment for a team that some would have considered a win dispensary going into the season. But Braden Wilson and Patrick Filter are both scoring well on high usage and Kansas are only looking to grow from here. So, uh, the Kansas Jayhawks take their rightful place in our 5 of the week, but we'll add to them as our 4th of the week is focusing on two more teams who seem to be uh, gaining form a little bit. Uh, we, on our program, seemingly can't get enough of the Fighting Irish, as they've been a topic of discussion on every single broadcast so far, and now we also have their star player co-hosting the program. Uh, the Fighting Irish ended their week to, and things were looking up. Uh, their last 10 record was positive, a 6-4, to four, and they won 4 straight during a home stretch, beating Shockers, Gonzaga, and the Texas Longhorns. They continued in that vein, visiting West Virginia Mountaineers and coming back with a tightly contested W, uh, 108 to 105. So, yeah, so um, we had a pretty successful first season last year, being the first expansion team to ever make the playoffs in their first season. Great achievement, yeah. Yeah, and so that was nice. And then uh, we came off to a surprisingly rocky start, which none of us, quite frankly, were expecting. Um, and yeah, I feel like the main reason for that was that towards the start of the season, we were playing a lot with the game plan to kind of change it around to maximize the benefits and all. And that was due to the fact that our team makeup kind of changed. Uh, we lost... Uh, well, our best player last year being our center, Prince Nelson. And uh, losing him kind of made us have to shift how we played the game. Furthermore, this season, uh, so we, as a whole, got better our TPE totals. So Joe and I both are uncapped and over 260 TPE. And then along with that, we have a better point guard, our power forward with Adam no, uh, with Mason Calloway stayed the same. And then we also got uh, Adam Ireland as our starting center for the season. And I feel like now that we kind of have our game plan down, things will start being better. Also now, yesterday, we signed a new player 
being Jamie Shields, 118 TPE, small forward, power forward. And I feel like things are looking up for us. And I feel we're a bit of a dark horse to make the playoffs right now, but I feel we can still make it. I'm not sure if it was me uh, calling the Fighting Irish a possible contender for the national championship game. Uh, I will try to hold on to that as long as the season goes on. But uh, one thing to mention about the Fighting Irish uh, also playing in the Atlantic Coast Division. Uh, maybe a tough tough division this year, seeing as they're only gone 4-9 uh, inside their division. But... Yeah. Uh, not necessarily uh, worse off on the road traveling or playing at home, just that the Tar Heels and Gators and yeah, uh, they faced off the Blue Devils once in North Carolina and they beat them handily 86 to 60. So taking a few skins of Tar Heels and Gators this remaining season, pro possibly a sign for them to turn it around and get above a 500 record. So, as you talked about Callaway, uh, Callaway deserves to be mentioned by a statistical standpoint. Uh, Callaway having a plus minus differential of only minus 0.1, uh, which is amazing on a below 500 team, while the mm -hmm. next best starter, uh, your character, Finzenglein, stands at minus one flat. So, Callaway proving to be a solid, solid starter player. Yeah. Where so uh, yeah. Callaway, he's a great defender. Last year he was very high in the block list, and this year his seeing as his role really improved. Uh, that only got better. Furthermore, for power forward he gets quite a lot of steals, and he really has a very defensive minded player. So he won't really put up many points seeing as he has no TPE uh, assigned to scoring but he really he's a defensive anchor and he's really very helpful on a team to have uh, the Kentucky Wildcats they are also really turning a leaf right now they had a rough start losing 19 of their first 21 games but now they really are improving as of the last sim on Monday, they have a, a record in the last 10 of 7-3, and three, and they're really, in my opinion, once again, like for the Jayhawks, their problem is that they don't have a true star. They don't have any player that's uncapped this season, so everyone's under, 100, uh, under 200 TPE, but therefore they have six out of their eight players, again, that are over... At 100 TPE, and I also think they are going to be a threat next season. Uh, yes, uh, overcoming a start like that, uh, only uh, anything, anything more than two losses out of 20, uh, two wins out of 21 can be positive. So turning it around this monumentally, uh, maybe can breed some overconfidence. But uh, as the players keep developing, maybe the game plan also around them keeps getting more fluid and more uh, established so their key currently seems to be focusing on defense and playing simple offense breaking down the washington huskies home and on the road and coming close to upsetting the shockers at home eventually losing out 94 to 95 they're uh, they are led by their point guard jaron flores who is clocking 37.1 minutes per game and is looking promising as a creator the kentucky wildcats are currently uh, bottom of the league in team assists but that hasn't stopped their role uh, and uh, jaron flores is trying his hardest to distribute the ball as he is not a threat yet from the outside or drive into the rim uh, have you noticed anything extremely particular about them and do you think this this kind of form can be sustainable um i feel like they're one of those teams that really is flying kind of under the radar for the season just because nobody really expected them to be a crazy contender 
But uh, for me, I find the fact that their point guard, Jaron Flores, uh, Flores, who you just mentioned, that he can put up the stats that he's putting up at the TPE total he's at right now. He's currently only at 82. And for the fact that he's putting up very good stat lines, I feel like that's very good and a sign of things that are to come in the future. And if they can keep it up, they're really going to be a great team next season. I would compare uh, Flores to um, Sean Stockton, the point guard from Georgetown Hoyas, who is not uh, necessarily flashy or makes big big numbers on the box scores, but uh, leads his team in minutes per game and uh, brings a feel to the offense, I believe. So, Mm -hmm. with Kentucky Wildcats and uh, the U- University of Notre Dame Fighting Irish added. Here we'll move on to our final of the week. The center five, fifth of the week is the ongoing battle between University of North Carolina Tar Heels and Oregon Ducks for top spot going to All Star Week and for the best record in the nation. Both squads have a lot of quality scoring and quality shooting from outside. Ending the week, Tar Heels sat on a 23-8 record, while Ducks, who were a game back, were leading the Pac-6 division with a 22-8 record. Tar Heels currently mostly consists of third-year players, with the exception being freshman forward Nemias Jr. and their backup point guard McGee Sachs who I believe led the league in three-point percentage last year as a freshman. Could their experience and possibly physical tools give them an edge in this battle? Um, well, yeah, mainly due to the fact that due to them being more experienced, they have had more time to get used to how this league works, how to get points, how to apply points, and I feel like it's really done them very good. Like it's, I, I looked up the average TPE totals for both teams, and the Tar Heels they have an average TPE of one hundred eighty, which is crazy high. Like of course it's mainly led by Tyrone Kings who has three hundred sixteen, but still they have one player only at underneath one hundred. At TPE and at 180, if that's your average team, that's crazy. And due to that, I think they are currently slightly better than uh, the Oregon Ducks, who are also a great team. Uh, they have an average of 166. But I feel like just the depth that the Tar Heels can bring to the table, it's crazy because even if one player falls out, they just have a second one that can come right back in and continue where the first left off. Definitely. So, uh, as you mentioned, Tyrone Kings, uh, both both programs have two players declared for the draft this upcoming uh, this this upcoming draft. So, for the Tar Heels, uh, guard pairing Tyrone Kings and Damian Wade, and for Oregon. Uh, shooting guard Stefan Lampe and uh, center Kevin Malone. Mm-hmm. If if you were a if you were in a position to draft any of these four players to your pro club, uh, which which of these four looks the most promising to you? Um, personally, I'd probably go with Tyrone Kings, just because he has shown that. Uh, he can score with the best of them, it be it from three or by painting to the line. Like I remember, we played the Tar Heels earlier this season, and he—I'm pretty sure he had 20 free throws that he scored. Yeah. He fouled out basically our entire team, and we really had a very tough matchup that game. So I'd probably go with him. I would also, if I was in a situation like this select Tyron Kings obviously if no team needs or anything to that notion were in question but uh, Stefan Lampe also 
is worth a mention. He is currently a senior year player and uh, he's been exceptionally consistent through mm -hmm. all his seasons in the uh, in the college level. Uh, 16.8 points per game in his first year and he's gone up to 18.4, 20.2 and now at 19.6 as the team is uh more more has more depth quality depth to handle the scoring load and uh, Stefan Lampe and Tyrone Kings are both looking like promising two guards uh before this season <clears throat> in our season preview episode we were talking about the possibility of rise in shooting guard quality as uh, the legacy of Max Winchester left from last season mm. is is something to consider but uh it's turned out to be a bit of a uh center focused uh the top of the scoring list is seemingly center focused with Hugo Nitt and Robotastic Prime leading the league in scoring but right below them they then comes Caramelo your character Zengline then Kings at 8th and um Probably honorable I mean, mentions there. Yeah. So I feel like the with the uh, centers, what they have going for them is that they don't really shoot three-pointers. The three-pointers in this league are kind of inconsistent because, like, my player, I have an 85 three-point rating. I have games where I shoot two for 12, and then the next game after that, I'll go eight for 12. And... So I feel like just the whole inside scoring, it's a lot safer. And that's why their field goal percentages are also always very good. And due to that, they consistently put up big numbers. And I mean, uh, they're all great players, but yeah, I mean, that's really all I can say to it. Yeah, it's obviously sometimes if you have a physically overpowering center with skill, uh, mm -hmm. It obviously leads to a situation where you physically overpower your yeah, defense exactly. and make your way to the rim. Uh, as uh, for smaller players like guards and wing players, uh, it's not necessarily about strength, your strength versus the opponent's physical strength. It's more like a, it's rough to say a technique and game plan based uh, mm -hmm. game, but that's probably more than likely yeah so which which club do you consider uh for the best record going to all-star weekend um well i mean i think that the uh, tar heels as of right now have a bit of an edge over the oregon ducks but it's really very small i feel like it's kind of similar like if they should end up in a finals against each other we would have a similar situation to what we did last year where the game's just ridiculously close, ridiculously close and you get a really epic final battle where each team puts it on, all on the line. Yes, so that will be our five of the week this week. Uh, before we go, a shout out to Hockey66 uh, for his quotes about Anthony Caramello and Again, Jogan for providing us with the play-by-play -play on this Syracuse Arizona game. So from me at Ococha Star and my partner, a cryptic pancake. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening, and we hope to catch you all again next week. <laughs>